بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونشكره ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساعة من يتع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعصهما فقد غوى حتى يفيء إلى أمر الله وإنه لا يضر إلا نفسه ولن يضر الله شيئا وقال الله عز من قائل أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Respected listeners Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh The title of today's speech is The Causes of Disunity As Muslims, we are always lamenting The lack of harmony and unity and division that we perceive to be so strongly present amongst us. One of the most famous questions posed by most people to themselves and to others, even to the ulama and to their friends and colleagues, and even in normal casual conversations, is how can we unite? How can we reduce disunity? Why are there so many divisions? Before I continue, there is one thing that we must accept. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned this in the Holy Quran. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has mentioned this in the hadith. That there will always be divisions. There will always be differences. And it's unrealistic and impractical and impossible for us to really ex expect the kind of unity and oneness that we dream of. There will always be differences of opinion. There will always be different methods. And sadly, there may always be conflict. However, of course, we can reduce it. We can curtail it. We can really curb it. And especially when it comes to difference of opinion, despite the presence of difference of opinion, that difference of opinion does not necessarily have to translate into outright hostility and conflict. And inshallah, on that topic, I will actually be speaking tomorrow when we have a speech somewhere here. Where is it? Marabella? In Marabella. And the title of that speech is Compassion Despite Disagreement. Some people, and the, some people may not fully understand the title, but this will be, inshallah, the topic. That differences of opinion have always existed in Islam. The Sahaba, radiyallahu anhum, differed amongst, amongst themselves as far as opinion was concerned. Even the prophets of Allah alayhi wa salatu wa salam had differing opinions. Sayyidina Suleiman and Sayyidina Dawood alayhi wa salatu wa salam, father and son, both prophets of Allah, when posed with a question, when posed with a problem, and they were asked to solve it and to address that issue, father and son, despite being knowledgeable, pious, both learned, and both the prophets of Allah alayhi wa salatu wa salam, both of them came to different conclusions. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ratified the opinion and Allah endorsed the opinion of the son, the younger one, Sayyidina Suleiman alayhi, alayhi salatu was salam, and not the father. So differences of opinion have always existed amongst prophets of Allah, amongst the noble companions and the disciples of the prophets, alayhi salatu was salam, and amongst the leading minds and scholars and ulama of Islam till this day. But differences of opinion should not be allowed to translate into outright conflict, hostility, and stupidity. And each, everything should be balanced. Everything should be within its limits. Father and son can disagree. Brother and sister can disagree about a matter. But Allah and His Rasul have shown us how such disagreements can be curtailed, can be controlled, and how both parties, whether they are individuals or large groups, can remain composed despite this difference, despite this disagreement. Allah and His Rasul have taught us that. Moving away from differences of opinion, as human beings, naturally, we will disagree with each other. As human beings, we are prone to misconstruing things, misunderstanding things. We are hot-tempered. We are quick-tempered. We are vulnerable. And we easily fall victim to temper, anger. And owing to all of this, we ourselves can be guilty and responsible for so many different issues. We are always asking how can we unite? How come the ulama are always arguing? How come the leaders are always in disputes and conflict? How come the community leaders are always differing and never in agreement? How come we are so divided? How come there is such hostility, there is such conflict, there is such disagreements? We are forever lamenting these problems. But the important question is, how do we as individuals, not even as groups, or even communities, or even a collection of individuals. But how do we as single individuals, a man, man to man, woman to woman, how do we act? What do we actually do positively and constructively to change the situation? We're always complaining. We're always lamenting the lack of unity and the disharmony, but what do we as individuals, man to man and woman to woman, actually do to alleviate some of that disagreement, to lessen its impact, to prevent it as much as possible, to reduce its impact? What do we actually do? And we do have a solution. It's in our hands. We may not be able to eradicate differences and divisions altogether, well, we can do a lot individually to control them, to curb them, to remain composed throughout, to behave honorably and responsibly, even in disagreement and dispute. Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have taught us much. And it's difficult to go through different verses and different surahs of the Holy Quran, or even through so many different ahadith on this topic. But what I will do, inshallah, is over the next hour or so, is share some thoughts with you about one particular surah of the Holy Qur'an which is an amazing surah and not the entire surah even but just a few verses from that surah and that's Surah Al-Hujarat in Surah Al-Hujarat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us certain guidelines if we follow those guidelines sincerely Wallahi Al-Azim by Allah by the promise of Allah and by the promise and the prophecy of His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we would see a heightened level of love and harmony between the people. We would see a much reduced level of hostility, suspicion and disagreement and conflict. But we can't forever just lament and complain and moan and groan about disunity and lack of harmony and yet do nothing as individuals to prevent such disunity 
and do nothing as individuals constructively and positively to actually bring about a change and increase harmony. We ourselves are individually and all equally responsible. And we can make a start, we can make a difference ourselves. And in the light of the few verses that I will discuss, let every one of us ask himself and herself that am I guilty of this? What have I done to avoid this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has shown unity in the world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has shown peace. Peace can be achieved. Unity can be attained. Strife and discord can be eliminated to a great degree. Maybe not entirely, but to a great degree. And we have seen that love and affection and harmony and cooperation amongst the noble companions of Allah anhum ajma'in. We have seen it. Their love for each other was such that it was unbelievable. As a whole community, Allah Azza wa Jal describes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we know how powerful and how great a personality the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was. His love, his affection, his composure, his wisdom, his intelligence, his foresight. He was the messenger of Allah and the best of all the best of Allah's creation without exception. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressing the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Law an fakta ma fil ardi jimi amma alafta bayna kurubihim wala kinna Allah alafa bayna. O Prophet of Allah, if you no one else, if you, O Messenger of Allah, if you, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was to spend the entire wealth of the world. If you were to spend all that is on earth, you would still never be able to bring harmony between them. You would still never be able to unite their hearts. But it is Allah who did indeed bring about love and harmony between them and joined and united their hearts. Even the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alone, despite being as great a personality as he was, if he was to spend the wealth of the entire world, he would have not been able to achieve this unity and harmony. It was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who did that. So Allah has shown it, but it was not without method. We want... We're always talking about the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. We want the unity of the Sahaba. We want the love and affection of the Sahaba. We want the harmony of the Sahaba. We want the jama'ah and the group and the sahbah of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. We want their congregation. We want their unity. But we can't just demand it, expect it, ask for it without working hard towards it. This ummah will never be able to unite unless they unite by the principles and the methods and the mechanisms that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them through which they united. We can't expect to achieve their unity and yet abandon their ways, abandon their principles and shun their legacy. Now what were the things that the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum did? What were the things that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did with them? What were the mechanisms that he employed? What were the principles and foundations on which their love, affection and harmony were based? Well just some of them, just some, not all, just a few of them are contained in the verses of Surah Al-Hujarat. So let's go through some of them. One, in one of the verses of Surah Al-Hujarat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu. In fact, in many of these verses, Allah begins the verses with the words, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu. Some of the verses that I will be discussing are, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu. In ja'akum fasqum binaba'in fatabayyanu. An tusibu qawmun bi jahalatin fatusbihu ala ma fa'altum nadimeen. Another verse, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu la yaskhar qawmun min qawmin asa an yakunu khayran minhum. وَلَا نِسَاءٌ مِّن نِسَاءٍ عَسَاءٍ إِن يَكُنَّ خَيْرًا مِّنْ عُنَّ Throughout the Holy Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala employs these words at the beginning of verses, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا O those who have believed. And before I continue, I'd just like to mention something here. 
Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu an, the great companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the sage and scholar of this ummah, he used to say, whenever Allah Azza wa Jal says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu in the Holy Qur'an, fakun anta al-muhaddath, Whenever Allah says, O oh believers, O oh those who have believed, then you, you alone as an individual, you become the addressee. Think that Allah is addressing you. When Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O those who have believed, don't think, don't imagine that this concerns everybody else except me. I'm not guilty of this. I'm not responsible for such behavior. This doesn't concern me. Allah is not addressing me. No, don't think that. And forget thinking that. Don't even think that Allah is addressing me along with everybody else. Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Masood radiallahu anhu used to say, whenever Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, all those who have believed, kun anta al-muhaddath, you become the one who is being spoken to and addressed directly and personally by Allah. So, for the rest of the evening, when we hear the verses of the Holy Qur'an, and Allah Azza wa Jal begins such verses, whether they are begun with the words, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu or not, but whenever we hear such verses, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, all those who have believed, then let every one of us, man to man, woman to woman, as individuals, let us be concerned about ourselves. Not think that, am I actually guilty of this sin or not? No. Let us think that Allah is speaking to me and addressing me individually, personally and directly. So the first verse that we will be discussing is, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, in jaakum fasiqum binabain fatabayyanu, an tusibu qawmun bi jahalatin fatusbihu ala ma fa'altum nadimi. Allah Azza wa Jal says, O oh believers, O oh those who have believed, if a sinful person comes to you with some news, then ascertain the truth, lest you inflict harm upon a people in ignorance, and then later you become remorseful and regretful. The meaning of this verse is very simple, O oh believers, O oh those, oh those who have believed, whenever you receive an item of news, whenever you hear some news, whenever you receive a report, then don't just swallow it piecemeal, don't just accept it without question, don't believe it hook, line and sinker, don't take it as being the absolute truth. Whenever you receive an item of news, a report, someone relaying or conveying something to you, فَتَبَيَّنُوا Then ascertain the truth and seek the truth. Verify the facts and ascertain the truth. Lest you inflict harm upon someone, upon a people, without realizing, in ignorance, and then later you come to regret this. In another verse of the Holy Quran in Surah An-Nisa, Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala says something similar. Wa idha ja'ahum amrun min al-amn aw al-khawf adha'u bih, wa law radduhu ila ar-rasul wa ila ulil amr minhum, la'alimahu alladhin yastanbitunahu minhum, wa law la fadlu Allah 'alaykum wa rahmatuhu lattaba'tum ash-shaytan illa qalila. Allah says, whenever an item of news reaches them relating to security or fear, they broadcast it and they spread it. Had they referred such news to the Messenger of Allah and to those of responsibility and authority amongst them, then those who would have researched the truth, they would have come to know of its reality. And had it not been for the grace of Allah and His bounty upon you and His mercy, you would have followed shaitan except in little. We don't really have time. So I'll just mention the summary meaning of both verses. In, in the verse of Surah An-Nisa, Allah condemns the attitude and the behavior of certain people in the city of al madinah Al-Munawwarah during the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says that whenever some news reach them of security or fear, 
The meaning of this is that people obviously as they travel, come in and out of the city, they see things, they hear things, and what, what's the habits of a lot of people? Whatever they hear, they convey. Whatever they see, they relay. Whatever someone tells them, they pass on. And so, even news relating to the security of the city of Medina at that time, or news that would create fear amongst the people, such news was passed on. If they heard about someone being attacked, immediately the news was relayed, without verification. If some news of victory was conveyed to them, immediately people would relate to each other without verifying the facts, without ascertaining the truth. As a result, there would be wild fluctuations in the emotions and the feelings and the fears of people. At times people would feel secure, at times people would feel extremely fearful. And it was all to do with relaying and conveying news. And the verse of Surah Al-Hujarat is similar, O oh, believers, if someone, if a, if, if a sinful person comes to you with some news, then فتبينوا, ascertain the truth, verify the facts before you make any decision. Now, coming back to our time, this verse is so pertinent and it's so relevant to the topic of unity and disunity. That whoever is guilty of such behavior, whether they are individuals or a group, they are all responsible for contributing to disharmony, strife, and discord, because this is exactly what happens. When people relay news and convey news and tell tales and say things to each other, about each other, without ascertaining the truth and without verifying the fact, this is one of the greatest contributors. One of, the, one of the chief things responsible for creating disharmony, disunity, strife and discord in the community. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us, whatever you hear, first of all, you shouldn't be listening to everything. Gossip is haram in Islam. Gossip is not harmless. Gossip is not a nuisance. Gossip is not to be scoffed at. When we hear the word gossip in the English language, we seem to dismiss it with a laugh. Oh, men gossip, women gossip, childish gossip. It doesn't matter. We look at gossip with some contempt, but we don't regard it as being harmful or haram. In Islam, carrying tales, gossiping is haram. It's not mild. It's not slightly harmful. It's destructive. In Islam, gossip is regarded as being destructive. How destructive? One Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi relates a hadith in his Sahih that the Prophet وسلم, passed by two graves and he said to the people, the companions who were with him, Inna Rasulullah says the two occupants of these graves are being punished and they are not being punished for anything major as for one of them he would carry tales and he would indulge in gossip one of the meanings of namima is gossip he would carry tales and he would indulge in gossip as for the other he would not be careful and cautious when it came to protecting himself from the effects of urine. And that's the meaning of the term, they are being punished but not being punished about something major. Of course, both of these things are major with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but people do not view them as being major. Who takes gossip seriously? But in the book of Allah, it's so serious that anyone who is guilty of indulging in gossip, of carrying tales, of conveying everything that they hear to others. That person is guilty of namima, and just one of the many punishments could be adab in the qabr, adab in the grave. In a hadith related by Imam Muslim rahmatullahi alayhi in his muqaddama of the sahih, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, kafa bil mar'i kathiban in yuhadith bi kulli ma sami' it is sufficient for a man to be a liar that he conveys everything that he hears. It's enough for a man to become a liar that he 
conveys everything that he hears. Why? If a person hears a hundred things a day, twenty of them will be true. Twenty of them will be exaggerations. Forty, forty of them will be half-truths mixed with lies and forty may be outright lies. If he conveys everything that he hears, he would have conveyed twenty truths, twenty exaggerations, forty half-truths and forty outright lies. When a person develops his habit of relaying everything that he hears, that's enough for him to be considered a liar in the book of Allah. Allah has told us to be cautious. When you hear something, you refer the matter to those that it concerns. One, you do not relay and convey everything that you hear, nor do you accept to yourselves unless you verify the facts and ascertain the truth. And people even misunderstand ascertaining the truth. Does it mean that whatever you hear, you suddenly start going out and asking questions that is this true, isn't this true? No. People grossly misunderstand this verse of the Quran. Allah isn't telling us that, okay, don't convey everything you hear, don't repeat everything that you hear. Rather, what you need to do is hesitate, pause, verify the facts, ascertain the truth, and then convey whatever you have to know. That's not the meaning. The meaning is ascertain the truth, verify the facts, أَن تُصِيبُوا قَوْمٌ بِجَهَالَةٍ Lest you inflict harm upon a group of people without realizing in ignorance and later you come to regret it. That means if you are in a position where you have to make a decision, where you have to reach a judgment, where you have to take some action, then before you reach this decision, before you pass this judgment, before you take this action, verify the facts and ascertain the truth. However, if you don't need to make a decision, you do not need to pass judgment, you do not have to take any action, then don't even bother verifying the facts or ascertaining the truth. Don't concern yourself with that news. Dismiss it. Ignore it. Flee from it. The backdrop to the revelation of this verse was the Prophet وسلم, sent someone to collect zakah from a certain tribe. He went. For some reason, he actually feared going to these people and approaching them. So what he did is that shortly before he arrived there, instead of actually visiting these people and demanding the payment of zakah from them on behalf of Rasulullah وسلم, he returned. And he came and he lied to the Prophet ﷺ. And he lied about these people saying they have refused to pay zakah. They have refused to pay zakah. Rasulullah ﷺ dispatched some Sahaba radiallahu anhum to confront them. It was then that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this verse of the Holy Qur'an and told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, O oh, oh, believers, all of you, whenever you receive some news, if a sinful person comes to you with some news, then what do you do? You verify the facts and you ascertain the truth before taking action, before reaching a decision, before passing judgment lest you inflict harm on a, on a people without realizing and you come to regret it afterwards. Now this was a perfect example. The person came and lied to the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ had to reach a decision. He had to make a judgment. He had to pass judgment. And he had to take action. And that action could have been as dangerous as launching an attack on those people for outright rebellion and disobedience of the leader all based on one lie. Since the Prophet ﷺ had to take action, he was commanded by Allah to verify all the facts and ascertain the truth and to ensure that everything that this person was telling him was accurate and true. That's the meaning of ascertain the facts and verify the truth. 
not in today's community, in our society, what happens when we receive news? News such as, that person has done this, this person has done that, this person has behaved in this way, this person's opinions are such, this person's actions are such. What do we do? We immediately begin conveying the news and telling everybody else, when we believe in it immediately, and we begin telling everybody. We think this is harmless, we think this is irrelevant. Wallahi, people won't realize how dangerous and destructive this is until they become victims of rumor mongering and gossip and suspicion, backbiting and slander and false allegations and accusations themselves. The day they become victims of suspicion and slander and false allegations, they will be the first to go around preaching this to others. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has warned us from the very beginning. So what do we do when we hear some news? As is common, oh, that man and that woman, this person and that person, she did this, she did that, she believes in this, this is her opinion, this is her behavior, this is her character, he does this, he does that, this is his opinion, this is his behavior. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. In one, in a few moments, we swiftly slander, lie, level false allegations, falsely accuse, judge and pass sentence and condemn other people. In one swift moment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't tell us that if you hear some news you start verifying the facts. For instance, if someone tells you, oh have you heard? Funa man such and such a person is involved with such and such a person they're embroiled in a romantic relationship they're having an affair she does this he does that this is just by way of example have you heard he is guilty of this sin he is guilty of this crime she is guilty of this behavior what do we as Muslims have to do what do we do can we believe no can we accept no is it our duty to verify the facts and ascertain the truth? Is it? Is it? Is it our duty to verify the facts and ascertain the truth? Is it? No. It's not. The only people upon whom it's a duty to verify the facts and ascertain the truth are those who are directly involved, directly affected, those who have to reach a decision, make a decision, pass judgment and take action. If someone goes to the father and says, your son is guilty of such behavior, now it's the duty of the father to verify the facts and ascertain the truth before he condemns his son and takes action against him. If someone comes up to the husband and says something about his wife, since she is his wife, she is his responsibility, her character, her conduct, her behavior, her thoughts, her opinions, everything about her, directly impacts him and his children and his family and his life. Of course, he would be expected to reach a judgment, to make a decision, or possibly to take action about her, his wife. It's, a, it's his duty to verify the facts and ascertain the truth. If someone approaches the wife about her husband and says, your husband is guilty of such behavior, then again, since his conduct, his behavior, his thoughts, his opinions, everything about him, it directly affects and impacts the wife before she passes judgment, before she reaches a decision, before she takes any action, she must verify the facts and ascertain the truth. It's about such people, those who are directly related, those who are affected, and those who have to make a decision. Everybody else, it doesn't concern them. What should be their response? Should they go and verify the facts and ascertain the truth? No. Their obligation in Islam is to dismiss it. How many of us fulfill that obligation? How many of us fulfill that obligation of dismissing what we hear about other people? If it's not related to us or doesn't directly concern us. And we don't have to make a decision or reach a judgment or take action about what we hear regarding other people. How many of us fulfill this obligation of Allah, of the Holy Quran, of actually dismissing whatever we hear? Of, first of all, avoiding hearing such things, if it falls on our ears, then to reprimand those who convey such things to us, and 
at the same time to dismiss whatever we hear and keep our minds free and clean and totally clear about such people. How many of us fulfill that obligation? To give you an example, lest some of you may think that, well, how is that Allah says we should verify the facts and ascertain the truth, and yet he is saying, don't. Well, let's look at Surah An-Nur. When Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha radiyallahu anha was accused, falsely, during her trial and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam's most difficult time, did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell the people of Medina, well, you heard this news, so go and verify the facts and ascertain the truth? Did Allah tell the people of Medina, before you pass judgment, before you make a decision, before you come to a conclusion about Aisha radiallahu anha, what you need to do is verify the facts and ascertain the truth. Did Allah say that? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually said, لَوْلَا إِذَ السَّمِعْتُمُوهُ ظَنَّ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتُ بِأَنفُسِهِمْ خَيْرًا وَقَالُوا هَذَا إِفْكُمْ مُبِينٌ And in another verse, وَلَوْلَا إِذْ سَمِعْتُمُوهُ قُلْتُمْ مَا يَكُونُ لَنَا أَنَّ تَكَلَّمَ بِهَذَا سُبْحَانَكَ هَذَا بُهْتَانٌ عَظِيمٌ In these two verses, Allah says, When? Why wasn't it? When you heard this rumor and this gossip and slander, why wasn't it that believing men and believing women thought good of themselves? And why didn't they say, this is a clear lie. Why wasn't it that when you heard this rumor and slander, why didn't you say, It's not even permissible for us to speak about this. Subhanak, may you be glorified and purified of all association of Allah. Hada buhtanun azim. This is a great calumny and slander. This is the obligation of a believer. It's not just about Umm al Mu'mineen Aisha radiallahu anha, and it's not just about one thing or one sin or one crime, or one misdemeanor. It's about all things related to other people that we hear, whose news we receive. We are under an obligation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to listen, not to lend an attentive ear, not to pay attention to such things, and to dismiss them outright without even bothering to verify the facts or ascertain the truth and only actually proceed as far as verifying the facts and ascertaining the truth if those matters directly concern us and we have to reach a decision or make a judgment or take action and the meaning of why it wasn't it that the believing men and believing women thought good of themselves is <clears throat> What Sayyidina Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiyallahu anhu did. Imagine, these were the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum. It was this kind of conduct that kept a lid on fitna in the community. It was this kind of conduct that prevented strife and discord and helped avoid, helped the whole community avoid being engulfed by flames and fires of fitna. It was this kind of conduct. What conduct? When Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiyallahu an, the first host of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even before this verse was revealed by Allah, his wife, Umm Ayyub al-Ansari radiyallahu anha, said to him, have you heard about Aisha? And then she repeated some of the rumors that she had heard. So Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiyallahu anhu said to her, O oh, Umm Ayyub, can you imagine yourself being guilty of such behavior? So Umm Ayyub al-Ansariya radiyallahu anha exclaimed in shock and surprise and protested her innocence categorically and vehemently saying that no, how could I ever do such a thing? So Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiyallahu anha simply said in reply to her for Aisha to khayrun minki then know that Aisha is far better than you. If you cannot imagine such behavior for yourself, then how can you imagine such things for Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha radiallahu anha? It was after his reply that Allah actually revealed this verse of the Holy Quran. The verse had not yet been revealed. Can you imagine Allah actually tells the entire Ummah of adopting the conduct and the behavior of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anha even before Allah revealed such verses of the Holy Quran? That this is how every believer should behave whenever he receives any news. 
regarding somebody else. What should he do? Why didn't the believing men and believing women think good of themselves? Meaning, they sh everyone should ask themselves. When we hear something, we should ask ourselves, would my father do this? Would my mother do this? Would my brother do this? Can I see myself doing such a thing? Well, subhanAllah, how arrogant of you. How delusional of you. How sinful of you to consider yourself innocent and above such things, yet you are willing to attribute them to everybody else. You know, if we practice this first principle of Surah Al-Hujarat, of first of all, not lending an attentive ear, not paying any attention to news that reaches us about anything or anyone, dismissing it, not even considering it permissible to speak about it, unless it directly concerns us and affects us. And if it directly concerns us and affects us, again, do we take it on board? No we then have to verify the facts and ascertain the truth before we reach any judgment, before we make any decision, before we take any action. And it's not about one issue, it could be about anything. When we fail to do this, what happens in the community? When we fail to apply this principle, what happens in the community? The entire community, it may be just a village, it may be a small town, it may be a city, it may be an entire country. It may be the whole globe. But even on the level of a small village, the whole community is consumed by the fire of fitna, slander, allegations, lies, gossip, backbiting. And how can that help unite the hearts of the believers? If every single person is contributing, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam actually says in a hadith that during the time of fitna, one slip of the tongue is like one strike of the sword. A slip of the tongue is like a strike of the sword. When a person strikes a sword and hits or hurts someone, Imagine the harm caused. Well, the Prophet ﷺ says, during the time of turmoil, strife, discord, confusion, and fitna, one, the, the words of the hadith aren't a slip. I'm just translating it as such in English. Otherwise, the real meaning would be one utterance of the tongue. One utterance of the tongue is like a strike of the sword. That's how much damage and harm it can cause during the days of fitna, during confusion. And we are always involved in fitna. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has instructed us to observe silence. To hold our peace, hold our tongue. This is just the first principle. Later, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِن طَائِفَتَانَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ اقْتَتَلُوا فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَهُمَا فَإِن بَغَتْ إِحْدَاهُمَا عَلَى الْأُخْرَى فَقَاتِلُوا الَّتِي تَبْغِي حَتَّى تَفِيءَ إِلَى أَمْرِ اللَّهِ فَإِن فَاءَتْ فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَهُمَا بِالْعَدْلِ وَأَقْسِطُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُقْسِطِينَ Allah says, if two groups amongst the believers become engaged in conflict with each other, then reconcile them. And if one group is unjust and transgressing against the other, then you side with the victims, you side with the other group, and then collectively, you remain, you remain hostile to them until you bring all back to the way of Allah. When they return to the path of Allah, then again turn to seeking reconciliation between the two with justice and justly and equitably. Indeed, Allah loves those who are just. What does that verse tell us? Allahu Akbar, something else which we shun, which we avoid, and whose obligation we fail to fulfill. Remember, there will always be disagreements. It's human nature. And prone to misunderstandings and misconstruing other people's statements and behavior, we, are, we often fall victim to suspicion, and we allow that to degenerate into outright conflict. Because of these things, 
It's human nature. We argue, we break away from each other, we misunderstand each other, we misread each other. And there is great scope for conflict. If two groups of believers, no matter how small or large, if they end up quarreling between themselves, arguing, fighting, even battling between themselves, what should the other believers do? Stand by the sidelines and spectate? Stand by the sidelines and watch? Stand by the sidelines and wait for the outcome? Turn away and say, it's not my business, it's not my problem, I'm not getting involved, we're not getting involved. No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if two groups of believers quarrel between themselves, فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَهُمَا Then it is your duty, O believers, collectively, to bring harmony between them, to seek reconciliation between them, to end their conflict, to end their quarreling and their arguing. We all have a duty. Now how many of us do that? How many of us actually say to each other that, look, these two groups are in disagreement. Let's seek some reconciliation between them. We know it's not easy. We know it's not easy. But in the long term, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the wisdom of Allah's law is that in the short term, it's not easy. You will not be able to save face. You will not be able to keep face. You will not be able to maintain a friendly relationship with everyone. You won't be able to keep everybody happy. That's a damage in the short term. But if you don't do that, the harm and the damage in the long term is that that fitna and that conflict and that dispute will engulf everyone and will affect you even worse than now. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has shown us a preventative measure. And that is that when a dispute arises, when a, conflict, when a conflict begins, when two parties, no matter how small or large these two groups may be, others, the believers, collectively should step in. They should seek reconciliation in a peaceful manner between the two. And this verse, because it was related during the time to the time of the Prophet ﷺ and spoke about certain incidents, this verse actually says that when the believers see that two groups of people, two groups of believers are quarreling between themselves and they try to advise both, one of them appears to be unjust and one of them does appear to be the transgressor, then what do you do then? Again, do you back off? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it's your obligation and duty to side with those who are not the transgressors. To side with those who are the victims and who are not the transgressors. If one side is willing to come to the table according to the law and the wisdom of Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa and His prophets, one side isn't, then you side with those who are the victims and who are willing and who do adopt a conciliatory stance and who are willing to abide by the teachings of Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam against those who are unjust, who are oppressive and who are transgressive. And then, this is for only as long as they refuse to return to the way of Allah. For in fa'at, once they, the other transgressing party returns to the way of Allah, again, فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَهُمَا بِالْعَدْلِ وَأَقْسِتُوا Seek reconciliation between these two parties justly and equitably. Allah loves those who are just. How many of us have fulfilled that obligation? Allah says we should take the initiative. And far from taking the initiative, how many of us have seen that when a person comes to us and says, look, I have a problem. Can you assist me? What's, what's a common response? We fob him off with a few sweet words. We make it out to him as though we are concerned for him. We do wish to help him. And we will try, but deep down, and behind that person's back, we may even actually confess to others that, look, I'm not getting involved. I don't want to get involved. Why? Ultimately, I don't want to spoil my relationship with this party or with that party. That's our kind of behavior. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in a hadith related by Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim and others, Al-Muslimu akhul Muslim la yudhlimuhu wa la yuslimu. A belief, it's a long hadith, but only this part concerns us. A Muslim is the brother of a Muslim. He does not oppress him himself. Now many of us think that, look, as long as I am good with others, alhamdulillah, I don't want to oppress anyone else. But we stop there. 
But the hadith continues. The words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam continue. The Prophet sallallahu didn't just say, a Muslim is a brother of a Muslim, he doesn't oppress him and that's it. No, he said, a Muslim is the brother of a Muslim, he doesn't oppress him, wala yuslimu, nor does he abandon him. Nor does he abandon him. He may not oppress him himself, but when he sees his fellow Muslim being oppressed, then in his oppression he doesn't abandon him. If someone turns to us and says, can you help? Can you settle the score between us? Can you advise the other person so that this conflict may be resolved? Can you help us seek reconciliation? How many of us actually get involved? This is not a luxury, it's not a nafal. You know, oh mashallah, if we do it, then we'll get a great reward. If we don't, then alhamdulillah, we're not responsible. It's not a nafal. It's not even a sunnah. It's not even a sunnah. It's not even a fardhul kifaya. Of course, in a way, it is a fardhul kifaya. If somebody's doing it, fine. If nobody's doing it, it's a fardh, it's an obligation upon us. How many of us have fulfilled this obligation? That's another principle. See, these are principles that we may not even be accustomed to. One, verifying the facts and ascertain the truth about news only if it concerns us. If it doesn't concern us, not to even bother listening and to dismiss it. Principle number one, how many of us abide by that? Principle number two, wherever there is disagreement, wherever there is conflict and dispute, to actually become involved in a sincere, just manner to seek reconciliation between quarreling parties and to bring about harmony and peace between them. Do you know how, beautiful the Prophet, how beautifully the Prophet ﷺ acted on this? The Prophet ﷺ rarely missed salah in his masjid. Rarely missed salah in his masjid. And there were very few occasions when the Prophet ﷺ was actually in the city of Medina. He was in the city of Medina. And he did not lead salah in Masjid al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when he wasn't present. One of those occasions was in the afternoon, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam learned that there were two groups of Muslims who were quarreling between themselves in a, a certain neighborhood that was at a distance from the Masjid. And this quarrel. escalated to the degree that they were throwing stones at each other. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam on his own initiative rose and in the afternoon after Dhuhr Salah he left his masjid and went to that neighborhood. When I say neighborhood, it wasn't close to the masjid, it was a settlement because Medina, rather than being a city the way we understand it today, was actually a city and a collection of various settlements, some of which were at a distance from each other. So it was one of those settlements the Prophet ﷺ went to it. And he remained preoccupied. And going there, he actually said, when the Muslims see conflict and dispute between themselves, then the Muslims, the believers, should try to bring about reconciliation between these two quarreling parties. And the Prophet ﷺ went to do that. Because he remained engaged and preoccupied in that, he actually missed his Asr Salah. And so Sayyidina Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, seeing that the Prophet ﷺ hadn't arrived and he was getting on, he led Salah. But the Prophet ﷺ was actually still in Medina and healthy at the time, but he was in a completely different area and he had gone there in an emergency unexpectedly. Why? To s resolve a conflict and to settle a dispute between the believers. To do sulh and bring about a truce. This is a sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, and not just a sunnah, but an obligation collectively upon the believers. If we abide by this principle also, by Allah, we will see much more love, affection and harmony between the believers. But we all have to take individual responsibility. We can't just be armchair critics and sit in our armchairs reclining with our feet up and say, Astaghfirullah, Funa is this, Astaghfirullah, Funa is that. Such conflicts, such disputes, such disagreements, no harmony. Well, by you sitting there uttering such words, what exactly are you contributing to harmony? and to resolving this disharmony.
Later in Surah Al-Hujurat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in fact, immediately after this verse, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةٌ فَأَسْلِحُوا بَيْنَ أَخَوَيْكُمْ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ The believers are only brothers between themselves, therefore reconcile your two differing brothers. And fear Allah in the hope that you may receive Allah's mercy. Allah reminds us that as mu'mineen, as believers, we are brothers, we are one family. And even within a family, we may have disagreements, we may fall out, we may feel indignant towards each other, we may feel slighted, we may feel offended, we may offend each other, we may argue over petty and silly things. But just like families, ultimately, the bond of blood and the connection of kin and clan and of, of the family, over, all of these things overcome these petty differences and disputes and ultimately they bring people together or at least keep them bonded despite their individual differences and disagreements. And believers should be the same. Of course. There will always be disagreements and dispute and conflict, but we have to behave like a family even in that disagreement, even in those conflicts and in those disputes. That's another principle. Treat one another, view one another as brothers and sisters of the same family. And not just the kind of hollow brother, sister that we have become, some of us may have become accustomed to. Today, subhanAllah, it's like every, every man is a brother and every woman is a sister. MashaAllah, brother Fulan, brother Fulan, brother Fulan, and sister Fulana, and sister Fulana, and sister Fulana. Sahaba radiallahu anhum, in the entire collection of hadith, very rarely you will see them address each other in this kind of artificial, simulated, affected way. No, they wouldn't say, uh, Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu wouldn't say, Akhi Umar and brother Umar and brother Uthman and brother Funa and brother Funa. They wouldn't speak like that to each other. Sahaba radiallahu anhum were Arabs. Straight, upright, honest, transparent, clear, honorable, noble. Sayyidina Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu if he ever addressed anyone, if he addressed Sayyidina Umar radiallahu an, he would say, Aba Hafs or Umar, direct. They wouldn't add suffixes and prefixes to their names, giving each other lengthy titles, Funa, 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 and then the name, and then a good number of prefix suffixes afterwards. Like we do today, subhanAllah, it's almost as though we elevate people publicly but privately, we love to hate them. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum weren't dishonest or hypocritical. If something needed to be said, they said it to each other's faces. They were honest and transparent. But despite the lack of all these formalities and these protocols, they were such Sahaba radiallahu anhum that they loved each other to the extent that Allah describes them in Surah Al-Hashr. وَالَّذِينَ تَبَوَّأُوا الدَّارَ وَالْإِيمَانَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ يُحِبُّونَ مَنْ هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِمْ وَلَا يَجِدُونَ فِي صُدُورِهِمْ حَاجَةً مِمَّا أُوتُوا وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصَةً وَمَنْ يُوقَ شُحَّ نَفْسِهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ Allah says, and speaking of the Ansar Sahaba رضي الله عنهم and those who occupied the city and who adopted iman and faith before the, uh, some of the muhajirun, they love those who have emigrated to them. And they do not harbor any resentment or reservation or doubt in their hearts towards these muhajirun sahaba radiyallahu anhum. You know what that verse means? The sahaba radiyallahu anhum emigrated from Mecca to Medina. They were foreigners. They came from another city. They came penniless, poor and destitute, having no possessions whatsoever. And when they arrived in Medina, the Prophet ﷺ made them brothers of each other and then they shared their wealth, they shared their homes, they slept with them, they took, overtook part of their accommodation. Yet the Ansar Sahaba عنهم, never ever looked upon the Muhajirun Sahaba, the emigrants, as a burden. And the hypocrites of Medina, this is exactly what they sought to do. They sought to create a divide and drive a wedge and create divisions between the Ansar of Medina and the Muhajirun of Mecca. 
And the hypocrites would actually say these very same things. They would say to their Ansar friends, that why do you tolerate these emigrants, these refugees, these poor and destitute people who have come from Mecca? Ever since they've arrived, we've seen nothing but trouble. Because of them, we have ended up fighting the Quraysh of Mecca. Because of them, the Quraysh have tried to invade our city. Because of them, they have surrounded our city. Because of these Muhajirun, we have lost our tribal and our business connections with different tribes of Arabia. Because of them, Medina is condemned by the people of Arabia and the neighboring countries. Because of them, we have had to share our wealth. We have seen a sudden and a very large influx of so many of them in the city. The way people behave towards refugees and foreigners, that's exactly what the hypocrites were trying to do. Create that impression about the Sahaba عنهم, from Mecca. They have taken our jobs, our women, our money, our wealth, our farms, our accommodation. They are a burden upon us. Despite these machinations of the hypocrites, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the Ansar Sahaba radiallahu anhum, their hearts remain cleaned. Not only were they totally unaffected by this propaganda, but Allah declares on their behalf, Yuhibbuna man hajra ilayhim. They love those who have emigrated to them. And not only do they love them, وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسَهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصَةً These Ansar Sahaba, they give privilege and preference to others over themselves, even though they may be suffering from extreme hunger themselves. They will go hungry, but they will give their food, their water and their drink to others. That was the love and the affection of the Sahaba رضي الله عنهم, because they acted on all of this. Another principle, Again, contained in Surah Al-Hujurat, immediately after this verse, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, la yashkhar qawmun min qawmin asa an yakunu khayran minhum, wa la nisa'un min nisa'in asa an yakunna khayran minhum, O believers, lest not a group of men amongst you mock and ridicule another group of men, lest those who are being ridiculed are better than those who are mocking them, and let not a group of women amongst you mock and ridicule another group of women, lest those who are being mocked are better than those who are ridiculing making fun of each other, poking fun at each other. This is, not, this is not something small. It's not something small. Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an, the same Sahabi radiallahu an that I mentioned in the beginning. Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an, upon hearing this verse of the Holy Qur'an, he would say, I fear mocking a dog. I fear mocking a dog because of this verse of the Holy Qur'an. What do we do? We mock each other, we make fun of each other, we poke fun at each other, we laugh at each other, we make jokes about each other, and we think this is creative humor. If you want to be humorous, laugh at yourself. Poke fun at yourself. Do not laugh at anyone else's expense. There is no concept of creating humor of creative humor about others whilst insulting them and demeaning them. Allah has forbidden this in the Holy Quran. And so clearly and categorically elsewhere, how often do you hear Allah say to the men, avoid this, and then separately say to the women, avoid this. But in this verse, Allah doesn't say, believers should not mock each other, no. Allah says, let not a group of men amongst you mock and ridicule another group of men, lest the ones who are being mocked and ridiculed are better than those who are mocking them. And let not a group of women ridicule a group of women, lest those who are being ridiculed are better than those who are mocking them. Once Ummul Mu'mineen Aisha radiallahu anha, she relates herself, in a hadith recorded by Imam Tirmidhi in his Sunan, that once she says, I, speaking about Safiya radiallahu ta'ala anha, another wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, who was short, who was slightly short, Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha radiallahu anha motioned, she never even said a word. She motioned with her hands about Umm al-Mu'mineen Safiya radiallahu anha that she's short. She motioned, with her hands. And then on another occasion, Umm Mu'mineen Aisha radiallahu anha imitated somebody else. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Oh Aisha, indeed you have said a word which if mixed with the ocean, water of the ocean, it would pollute it and dilute it. 
one word just to say about another woman that she is short and motion in that manner in a mocking way that in a, that one signal that one indication is enough it's corrosive and polluting and contaminating enough to dilute and contaminate the entire water of the ocean and then the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said oh aisha even if i was given so much so much wealth i would never imitate anyone do not imitate others do not mock others do not ridicule others abdullah ibn masud radiyallahu an being a companion of the prophet of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam after hearing this verse of the holy quran and in the context of this verse of the quran says i fear mocking a dog Allah then says, وَلَا تَلْمِزُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Do not defame yourselves. Why does Allah say, do not defame yourselves, instead of saying, do not defame each other? Why does Allah say, do not defame your, each other? Why, sorry, why does He say, do not defame yourselves, rather than saying, do not defame each other? Allahu Akbar. Because the, mean, the reason is, if a person tries to defame another, a time when it will soon come when he shall be defamed himself. And ultimately, the harm and the sin and the damage of defaming each other will hit all of us. And therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, viewing the longer term consequence, says, O oh believers, do not defame yourselves. Because I, if you try to defame each other, ultimately you will defame yourselves. And there's a very beautiful hadith that explains this meaning. Imam Tirmidhi and Imam Ibn Majah, rahmatullahi alayhima, both relate in their sunan as well as others, that once Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ascended the mimbar in a very angry manner, and angrily ascending the mimbar, he loudly exclaimed, Ya ma'ashara man amana bilisanikum, وَلَمَّا يَدْخُلِ الْإِيمَانُ قُلُوبَكُمْ Actually, يَا مَعْشِرَ مَنْ آمَنَ بِلِسَانِهِ وَلَمَّا يَدْخُلِ الْإِيمَانُ قَلْبَهِ That's one narration. O oh, assembly of those who have believed with their tongues, but Iman has not yet entered their hearts. Imagine the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ascending the mimbar, ascending the mimbar, and loudly and angrily addressing everyone and speaking thus. Imagine the scene. Picture the scene. يَا مَعْشَرَ مَنْ آمَنَ بِلِسَانِهِ وَلَمَّا يَدْخُلِ الْإِيمَانُ قَلْبَهِ O assembly of those who have believed with their tongues, but Iman has not yet entered their hearts. لَا تَغْتَابُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا عَوْرَاتِهِمْ فَإِنَّ مَنْ تَتَبَّعَ عَوْرَاتِهِمْ تَتَبَّعَ اللَّهُ عَوْرَتَهُ وَمَنْ تَتَبَّعَ اللَّهُ عَوْرَتَهُ يَفْضَحُ وَلَوْ فِي جَوْفِ رَحْلِهِ Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, O oh, assembly of those who have believed with their tongues but Iman has not yet entered their hearts, do not backbite the Muslims and do not search for their faults. For whoever searches for the faults of the Muslims, Allah will search for his fault. See the wording? Whoever searches for the faults, plural, of the Muslims, Allah will search for his fault, a single fault. He who searches for the faults, plural, of the Muslims, Allah will search for his fault. And whoever's fault Allah searches for, يَفْضَحُ وَلَوْ فِي جَوْفِ رَحْلِهِ Allah will disgrace him even in the midst and the privacy of his own home. Therefore Allah says, وَلَا تَلْمِزُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Do not defame yourselves, because if you go out and try to defame anybody else, soon a time will come when Allah will defame you. So do not defame yourselves. وَلَا تَنَابَزُوا بِالْأَلْقَابِ And do not call out to each other with offensive names. Do not call out to each other with offensive names. بِئْسِ الْإِسْمُ الْفُسُوقُ بَعْدَ الْإِيمَانِ وَمَنْ لَمْ يَتُبْ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الظَّالِمُونَ Evil indeed is sin after Iman. And whoever does not repent, then these are the ones who are sinful. What does this verse, the end of this verse mean? Quite simply, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored you with the gift of Iman, it is evil indeed for believers to engage in these behaviors after having been blessed with the gift of Iman. And if someone doesn't repent of such behaviors, these are the ones who are sinful. The next verse says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu jhtanibu kathiran min al O believers, abstain excessively from suspicion. Abstain from excessive speculation. In the ba'd al-dhanni ithm, indeed some instances of conjecture are a sin. Do not 
be suspicious. Do not resort to speculation. Do not resort to conjecture. Do not imagine things about people. Even if you see something, dismiss it. Unless you have absolute proof. Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi used to say that if a believer says something to you, or you see something about him, from him, and what you have seen or what you have heard from him or about him has 100 possible explanations, 99 of them unfavorable and undesirable, and only one of them favorable and positive, then ignore the 99 and give his actions or his deeds or his statements that one out of 100 favorable interpretation. Avoid suspicion, avoid speculation, avoid conjecture. وَلَا تَجَسَّسُوا And do not search for each other's faults. وَلَا يَغْتَبْ بَعْضُكُمْ بَعْضًا And do not backbite each other. أَيُحِبُّ أَحَدُكُمْ أَنْ يَأْكُلَ لَحْمَ أَخِيهِ مَيْتًا فَكَرِهْتُمُوهُ Would any one of you wish to consume the flesh of his dead brother? Of course you would resent it. And fear Allah in the hope that you may succeed. I'll end here. But these, this last part of the verse means do not backbite. And you see, it's a natural progression. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says at the beginning of the verse, do not resort to conjecture, do not speculate. Then he says, do not search for each other's faults. Then he says, do not backbite. Why does Allah mention these three sins in that particular order? Because that's how it all begins. Someone doesn't have a clue about something. They hear something, they see something, they learn about something, then they begin to cook something up in their minds. They resort to conjecture speculation their mind goes into overdrive imagining things and where there was absolutely nothing now they've already got a half-baked story so what do they do their mind does not let them rest their soul does not let them rest what do they do in order to further and maybe verify their half-cooked ideas and their half-baked ideas all coming out of nothing, which is all just pure speculation and conjecture and suspicion. What do they do? They try to verify the facts. They try to ascertain the truth. So what do they do? They go out and investigate. They investigate, they begin to research, question, ask. Now they've already reached halfway. By asking the right questions, or what they think are the right questions, by investigating, searching for others' faults, what they half believe now becomes an absolute conviction. Now they believe utterly that this is true about this person. Once they convince themselves, their soul does not let them rest. They feel the itch, they feel the urge, the need to inform others and spread the good news. So what do they do? They go around telling everyone. And that's ghibah. And that's the natural progression. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to cut it from the root. Don't resort to conjecture. Shun suspicion. Avoid speculation. Because if you engage in suspicion and speculation and conjecture, you, your soul and your nafs and shaitan will compel you to investigating each other's faults. When you investigate each other's faults, your nafs and shaitan will then compel you to backbiting and slandering. And backbiting, what does backbiting mean? This is something many of us grossly misunderstand. Backbiting, we have various interpretations of backbiting. Some of us say, oh, you know what backbiting is? Is to say something behind someone's back when you can't say it to their face. That's not backbiting. That's what many people say, yeah, yeah, I'm talking about him. But I've got the guts to say it in front of him. I'll say it to his face as well, and I'm telling you now. That's not backbiting. Backbiting, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has already given us a definition of backbiting. In a hadith related by Imam Tirmidhi in the Sunan, Rasulullah, Sayyidina Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu relates, Qila ya Rasulullah, mal ghibah. It was said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O Messenger of Allah, what's backbiting? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied and gave a very beautiful definition. Dhikruka akhaka bima yakra. In fact, Imam Muslim rahmatullahi also relates this hadith. You're mentioning about your brother that which he dislikes. He doesn't say in his absence or presence, Bas, dhikruka akhaka bima yakra. You're mentioning anything about your brother which is, which he dislikes. So the Sahaba said, Ya Rasul, or Sahabi said, Ya Rasulullah, what if what I am saying about my brother is true about him? So the Prophet said, if you say something 
about your brother that he would dislike and it's true about him then you have backbited him and if it's not true about him then you have slandered him it doesn't matter whether it's true or false if it's false it's slander it's calumny and if it's true then it's backbiting you're mentioning anything about your brother that he would dislike simple therefore avoid speaking anything saying anything about anyone that they would dislike that's ghibah and ghibah Allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has termed ghibah and backbiting cannibalism the consuming of a person's flesh I'll end with this one final story about backbiting that will explain to us the meaning of consuming someone's flesh and how terrible it is and how the sins of the tongue are worse possibly at times than the sins of the flesh Imam Abu Dawood relates a hadith in his sunan that a man came to the Prophet and he confessed to the sin of adultery so the Prophet ﷺ administered the punishment. It's a long story, I'm summarizing it. He administered the punishment. The Sahabi radiallahu an passed away and departed from this world. Two individuals spoke about him. One said to the other, and this was within earshot of the Messenger. ﷺ. So the two individuals, one said to the other, look at him. He committed a sin and Allah concealed his sin. He committed a sin and Allah concealed his sin, but his soul did not let him rest until he had to confess. And now look at him, he is dying the death of a dog. Prophet heard them, but he didn't say anything to them. Later, they were traveling with the Prophet. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam passed by the carcass of an animal by the roadside. He stopped. A dead animal was by the roadside. Carcass, stinking carcass. He stopped and he summoned those two men saying, where are those two men who spoke thus to each other earlier? So the two men came forward. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said to them, both of you dismount and eat the flesh of this dead animal eat from this carcass so they both said Ya Rasulullah how can we eat the carcass of this animal how can we be expected to eat the flesh of this dead animal so the Prophet Sallallahu said what you consumed of the flesh of your brother earlier was a worse devouring than even this what you ate of your fellow, what you ate of your brother's flesh earlier was a worse devouring and a worse eating and consumption than this carcass. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, By Allah, even now I can see him diving into the streams of Jannah. Imagine the comparison. Someone who committed adultery. Of him Rasulullah ﷺ says, because he repented, by Allah, even now I can see him diving into the streams of Jannah after he had passed away. But for the two who simply spoke ill of him, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, dismount and eat of the flesh of this dead animal, eat of this carcass. And then when they obviously exclaimed their shock and surprise, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, what you ate of, your, of the flesh of your fellow Muslim earlier, of your brother earlier was a worse consumption and a worse devouring than even eating the carcass of this animal. That's why Allah has called it cannibalism. Backbiting your fellow Muslim, backbiting your brother is like eating and consuming the flesh of your brother. And backbiting is not that, like, oh, I can say it to him as well. No, no. Backbiting, as the Messenger وسلم, defined, is to say anything about your fellow Muslim that he would dislike. Presence, absence, truthful, not truthful, it doesn't matter. You see, these are just some of the principles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed in just one surah of the Quran. Just some. 
which if we as Muslims individually abide by, forget everybody else, and I address myself first, and we should all be considering ourselves to be individual addressees of this message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we abide by some of these principles by Allah, we would at least see a reduction in the confusion and the conflict and the disputes and the disharmony, strife and discord that engulfs our communities at times. And we would see a great level of affection and love and harmony between ourselves. If we abided by some of these principles, avoid backbiting, avoid suspicion, conjecture and speculation, avoid searching for each other's faults, avoid suspicion. Let us not call out to each other with offensive names. Let us not try to defame each other and eventually end up defaming ourselves. Let us not mock each other or let us not ridicule or make fun and poke fun at each other. Let us consider ourselves as brothers and sisters and not in a hollow manner but in a sincere and very profound manner. When we see conflict and disagreement between two groups of Muslims, let us not move away and spectate from the sidelines but rather let us sincerely and responsibly get involved and seek a reconciliation between them and try to resolve the dispute and let us be just in doing so and when we hear some news let us verify the facts and ascertain the truth and not accept it only if it directly concerns us if it doesn't concern us let us dismiss it outright and not even consider it permissible as the Sahaba did to even discuss it any further if we abide by some of these principles, then as Allah has promised, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has foretold, we may be able to reduce some of our confusion, disputes and conflict and see greater harmony and greater cooperation and more love and affection between the believers. It is possible. We may not be able to eradicate disunity and disharmony and disagreement entirely as I said right at the beginning, but we could bring it about as close as possible to the love and harmony that should exist between the believers if only we as individually we individually responsibly we abide by some of these principles i pray that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unites our hearts and creates harmony between us wa sallallahu wa sallam ala abdihi wa rasuli nabiyyina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in subhanakallahumma bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu